constantly upgrading. I mean, that yeah. seems to be the theme in this this discussion yeah. is that you get to one sta- stage, you're okay, but now it's ready for an upgrade. Yeah. Stage, okay, now ready for an upgrade. Yeah. So now you're upgrading to the buying side of the spectrum. Yeah. How, like, what did you learn most about yourself in that experience? Yeah. Um, the importance of relationships and okay. me getting out of my comfort zone. Okay. You know, because it's like... Me, I'm I'm an outgoing, personable guy. You are definitely 100. percent But there's a lot of times where I just kind of go inside, and mm-hmm. I don't want to talk to anybody. And like, but in the business, especially when you go to industry events, as mm-hmm. you know, you go to a lot as well. Yeah. Like that doesn't help you. Yeah. So like, just separating myself. Like, okay, this is the time I need to be that outgoing, personable guy. Yeah. And maybe tomorrow I can be to myself. But like today is the day I need to step it up. And really just go out there and start shaking people's hands and introducing myself. Eric, thank you so much for jumping in here and and being willing to sit down with me and have this conversation. I know we've known each other for a little while now, but I'd like to, to get to know you even better and give the audience an opportunity to learn more about you and your story. Absolutely, Edward. It's a pleasure. I was super excited when... Flo reached out, you know, and we we met, what, I'd say almost a year ago. Almost now. exactly a yeah. year ago. Yeah, it was October, I think, in um, Boise, Idaho. Yeah, I think so. At Russell's event. So, you know, yeah, it's, I'm excited. Awesome, awesome. So what I typically do uh, is I sit down in these conversations, and I'd like to start off giving the audience an understanding of who you are deep down inside. Yeah. And the best way I think – that has historically proven to be true is to go back in time. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your, your upbringing. I mean, we're both Jersey boys. Yeah. So, so tell me about like, what was the young Eric like? Yeah. So born and raised in New Jersey, uh, Hackensack hospital and my family, uh, mother, father, they're still married today. Okay. Um, so medium income household. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have, you know, super, uh, nice things, but I had everything that I needed. Okay. So there was no struggles there. You know, we went on a vacation once a year and okay. went skiing in the winter. So upbringing, completely normal. Mm-hmm. Um, I have an older brother uh, who taught me a lot just about being a person. You know, someone, mm. when you surround yourself with anybody really older, they have the knowledge and the wisdom that you just don't have when you're younger. Did you recognize that when you were a kid, though? I did. I oh, did. Okay. I always thought it was super cool, the conversations he would have with his friends. They just seemed more advanced yeah, yeah. Than, than what I was capable of adhering to at the time. So okay. it was exciting, and I was I always looked forward to whenever he would allow me to be around him. You know, okay. Sort of like a role model. Then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that's who actually, before I came in here, I was on the phone with him. He, he now, we work together, and okay. it's, the relationship continues to grow. Wonderful. How about how about uh, schooling? Like, tell me a little bit about your your experience in school. When you yeah, were so school. I was a C student. Okay, pretty standard for me. I, I had this slogan. It was like C's get degrees. Um, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my parents they always had visions of college, and um, but in high school, I I just I, I school wasn't for me. Okay, you know, so I I went half the day to a vocational school. Oh, okay. Um, in Morris County, and I learned the trade of carpentry. Wow. Um, and that was really, I guess, my second mentor after my brother was this gentleman, Mr. Weems. And, and he taught me about, like, discipline and sacrifice and really honing in on a craft. Wow. Um, and at that time, I, I won these awards, and they would flew me around the country. Wow. And so you were really into carpentry. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I stuck with it. And More I than just, just ex- woodworking, you were, like, into it. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was cool, you know, yeah. getting these accolades and flying me around and giving me these awards. And there were some cash bonuses, which when you're 17, 18 years old, like, stuff like that can really increase your morale. Oh, yes. And it can change the whole trajectory if you allow it to. Wow. So um, would you point to that as something that did change your trajectory? Yeah, yeah. Okay. If if not for that vocational experience, do you think your life would have turned out completely differently? Or? Yeah, completely differently. Wow. You know, so so that mentor at the time, my teacher, Mr. Weems, he said, Eric, you should go to college and consider being, a, you know, a construction manager, an engineer. You don't want to be a laborer all day. Mm. He would show me his knees and he had bolts in his knees because wow. he's been doing carpentry work for 40, 50 years. So mm. he's like, you don't want to do what I did. Mm. You know, so he said, you should go to college. I was like, okay. Applied to some schools, got accepted to a few, and I ended up going to NYU. Wow. Yeah. How was that experience? Um, It was tough initially. You know, I was definitely the bottom of the totem pole. 
Okay. I went from being... NYU is uh, a big school. Yeah, NYU is a really big school and a lot of international students, mm-hmm. you know, very intelligent international students. So it was very intimidating mm-hmm. for me. And they only accepted me um, with like a clause that I do a summer program okay. to kind of get me a little more advanced for the math and the science that okay. I was going to have to take. Okay. Um, now, did you live at NYU or did you Yeah, I, home? I lived on campus. Okay. I, I went to their Brooklyn campus. Brooklyn. It was called okay. Polytechnic Polytech- University at the time. And, yeah, so I lived in Brooklyn for, for three or four years. How did you enjoy that? It was fun. You yeah. know, I love the city. I've been going to the city my whole life. It's You take it for granted. You know. You definitely do. Yeah, you, I mean, you live I grew up in South <laughs> yeah. Jersey, but I lived in North Jersey for a lot of my adult life. So, yeah, yeah definitely take advantage of that. Uh, yeah. Like, people come from all over the world to go to New York City, yeah. and it's in our backyard, and sometimes I just don't appreciate yeah. it for what it is. Yeah, you definitely don't go there as often as you probably should just yeah. because it's so convenient. Yeah. So I was in school, and at the time, you know, I, sh- I struggled. Part of my story, a big part of my story is alcoholism and drug addiction. Okay. Um, you know, I started at maybe 15, 16 years old, you know, dabbling. and With everything? Yeah. or Well, it progressed, okay. you know. Started just drinking and smoking, and, uh, you know, and then I started selling some things. And, and, and it, it taught me a lot about entrepreneurship. Okay. But I wasn't able to implement that for the good until right, right. many, many, many years later. Okay. You know, so I ended up dropping out of college. I ended uh, up essentially living out of my car. Mm-hmm. Um, I was estranged from my family, my friends. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. Yeah. You know, and this is over the course of multiple years. Well, of, I, do- I totally get it. doing the same it. stuff. So I, was, I reached a point in my life where I was completely broken and hopeless. You know. What, what do you... Th- what would you say is the, like, the number one factor that led to that, like the broken broken and hopeless yeah. state? Like, was there one thing or was it just a multitude of factors? I would say is it was a spiritual bottom. Okay. You know, it wasn't the uh, arrests. It wasn't the uh, homelessness. It wasn't the lack of money. It wasn't the lack of relationships with friends. It's just one morning I woke up and I looked in the mirror. Mm-hmm. I didn't know who I was anymore. Truly empty. Yeah. I just, I was completely lost, and I knew something had to change. I knew something had to change. Couldn't go on like that. It was miserable, miserable. Well, the fact that you knew you had to change was the first step. Yeah. What was the catalyst that caused the change? Yeah. So I I went to this self-help group. Okay. Right? And I met this gentleman by the name of Rob, who I would consider mentor number three for me. Okay. Um, And Rob said, listen, Eric, something about me attracted it, or something about him attracted me mm-hmm. to what he was talking about, you know, just his presence. He had a full-time job. He had a young daughter. Okay. He had a good-looking girlfriend. He was put together, but his story was the same as mine. Oh, okay. He was just a few years advanced. Mm-hmm. So it was like, if this guy can do it, maybe I can do it too. He had been through what you were yes. going through. yes. And made it through to the other yeah, side. Yeah, and it was like four or five years. He was sober at the time, and I was like, I want what this guy has. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know? So and I walked up to him. Okay. What was that conversation like? I was just like, listen, Rob, man, I, I know you shared some stuff in the meetings, and it's just interesting to see that you used to live the life I'm living now, and you no longer live that life. Like, what do I need to do to have what you have? Mm. And he just said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to call me every day, mm-hmm. no excuses, um, and you're going to meet with me once a week. And I just said, okay. And I did that the next day, and I ended up doing that for almost four or five years straight. Wow. Yeah. So you made the decision. Yeah. And then you committed to it. Yeah. That's amazing. I had no other choice. It was either well, continue you, to live. You did have a choice. Yeah. You chose, but you chose the right one. Yeah. You made yeah. the right choice. Yeah. When, when you look at those four to five years of checking in, if you will, getting constant guidance from this new mentor, mentor number yeah. three, if you will. Yeah. Like what? What were some of the things that were like critical to your development? Critical yeah. to you getting through what you were going through? Yeah. So I think one of the most beneficial things he taught me, and then I still incorporate in my businesses in my life today, is mm-hmm. um, the process of being of service to other people. Wonderful. You know, because and his whole explanation, and it makes absolute sense, is like when I'm helping someone else, I'm not thinking about me. Yeah. So there's no time to get stuck up here, mm-hmm. because my focus is on them. So when I'm sitting knee to knee and helping somebody or, you know, even if it's something simple as giving someone a hand with a move, like while I'm doing that, not focused yeah. on me. And I still incorporate that and it's been a game changer. 
amazing. Yeah. When you look at that that four to five year transition period, yeah. coming from rock bottom to getting back on your feet, what were some other things that may have been going on at the time? Were you like transitioning, trying different jobs? Oh like, what yeah, was that like? yeah, yeah. So. Because you didn't go back to school, right? You didn't. I did. Oh, you many, did many years later. Years later, but yeah. not initially. Not, not initially. initially. So what did you do? Um, so initially, right when I got sober, I about two weeks in, a good friend of mine who struggles with some of the same things I struggle with, he he had some legal problems and he had to go to, to uh, jail for a couple months. And he said, Eric, um, and at the time I was working at his construction company as a laborer, okay. Okay. just for a couple weeks. I just, you know, just, um, it was a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, Eric, I have to go away. Um, I see what you're doing. I know it's only been like three or four weeks since you're kind of getting your life together, but I feel like this time it's different. Okay. It's like I see this sparkle in your eye, and I, I'm about to go away for eight eight to nine months, and mm -hmm. I need someone to run my, my construction company. Okay. And he's like, can you do it? And I, was, I gave him a big hug, and he cried, and I cried, and it was a very emotional moment. And uh, I said, sure, I'll do it. I did that for almost a full year and you know, made made it the company a lot of money. And that was kind of my foundation of me being able to make a reasonable salary to kind of put some money in the bank, get myself a car, get off my feet a little bit. OK, that was like the catalyst to kind of the so rest of there my was life. so much going on then in this period yeah. of time, like you're finally getting your 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 act together, if you yeah. will. But it's also like some remarkable things entered into your life yeah. in order to make that possible. Yeah. Like this situation with this friend of yours, obviously it was hard for him having to leave the business, but he trusted you enough to take care of it. Yeah. And you did. You took care of it for yeah. a year. When you look at that year, was there anything that you learned about yourself in that process? Oh, definitely. Tell me about that. Definitely. Um, so I learned the, the importance of taking time to myself, you know, prayer, meditation is specifically for me. Okay. Um, it's so easy to get caught in the day to day. Mm -hmm. And I realized that when I was now operating three to four construction sites, you know, there were seven to 10 employees, there's moving around. And before you know it, you're up at seven, six thirty, seven a.m. You get home, it's nine, 10 o'clock at night. You, I spent no time for myself. And after about two weeks of doing that, I was like, this cannot work. If I continue to do this, I will go back to my old ways. Right. So during those first that first year, I really started to allocate time in the morning to pray, meditate, get myself centered. Okay. And I still incorporate that in my life. You know, now it's almost eight or nine years later. Wow. So that's part of your daily routine. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It has to be. Okay. For me personally. When when you look at, at now you've you finished that year of service for your friend. Yeah. What was the next transition? Yeah, so it's funny. It's a funny story. I He got out, and he's like, Eric, you can keep working for me. You know, but once I, he gave me the number, yeah, yeah. and what I, <laughs> it was like maybe 60% of, of what I was. Were. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I was like, Matt, I appreciate it, but this that's not, that's not the opportunity for me. I'm not downgrading. I right. need to upgrade. Okay. Yeah, you know, I gave him a big hug, thanked him for the experience, let him know if you need anything, I'm here for you. Um, so I started applying for jobs. Okay. And uh, previous to this construction job, Sebastian, who you know. Yeah, I know my, Sebastian. My business partner, he started selling on Amazon. Okay. And uh, I worked on and off for him, just like helping You're him in there, his right? house. I kind of learned the basics. And he told me, Eric, if you ever need a job, call me. Mm -hmm. So I started applying for jobs, and I would use him as a reference. Okay. Because I've known him for... <laughs> You know, a long while, yeah, yeah, 10 years at that time, 15 yeah. years at that time. And so I, and I worked for him, so I'd use him as a reference and Matt as well. And uh, he started getting these phone calls. And like, is Eric a good guy? Has he worked for you? And he gave him the rundown. And yeah, Eric's great. He's a hard worker. He learns quick. Um, and then he called me and said, Eric, why are you applying to jobs? I told you. I have one. Yeah, <laughs> I have you. He's like, I need my right-hand man. Like, well, let's do this. Wow. And uh, about three days later, I started... Um, the business that I still own today and, and part of today, which is our Amazon business, which is thriving. Okay. Now, yeah. as you when you started with him, though, you were starting as an employee. Yeah, I was an employee. How did you make the transition from employee to partner? Yeah. Like, what was that like? Yeah, I started from the bottom. Okay. I started in the warehouse. I was maybe getting paid at the time fifteen dollars an hour. Okay. Um, so, so let me let, let's backtrack because th I think it's important for for the audience to understand this. Uh, your friend at the time had an 
a thriving Amazon business. I mean, the fact that you have a warehouse means yeah. that you have inventory. Yeah. Like, describe what was that? What was that like? What was the warehouse like at that time? Yeah. So originally it started a basement. Okay. And then we ran out of space. So we had to get a warehouse. Okay. The first warehouse was only a thousand square feet. Uh, you say only a thousand <laughs> square feet. There are there are thousands upon <laughs> thousands upon thousands of uh, Amazon sellers that don't have yeah hundred square feet. Yeah. So. Only a thousand. Yeah, but we okay. knew that it's just the same thing. Just for yeah. me running the construction company, him, yeah. you know, having some experience. It's like we can't grow in our three hundred square foot basement. Right. Right. Okay. You know, so, so you upgrade it. Yeah. So we upgraded, and in that warehouse, I was doing a lot of the manual work. Okay. The the, the foundational things like that what? I think like help me understand. So it. labeling products, inventory. Okay. So when you buy a, a product to sell on Amazon, like all the products have a UPC a SKU, code. A UPC code. Yeah, okay. and you, that needs to be covered mm -hmm. with a SKU from yeah. Amazon exactly so like doing that tedious so work the yeah physically manually putting yeah. labels over the yeah the UPC code or like program. making a, a three pack or a six pack so you put them in poly bags and, okay you know and then taping them sealing them and then putting them in another box so just warehouse work okay I did that for maybe four four to six months okay kind of learn the ropes of the industry okay what was what was that challenging at, uh, for you or no. like just routine no, it was routine, and I remember when he, it was maybe two weeks in, he gave me a key to the place, and I would get in at 8 in the morning at Just the time. Boom. Yeah, I didn't have a car. Mm -hmm. I would take two buses and then to walk. get there. Yeah, and then walk a mile and a half to get to work every day. Wow. Um, and I would get in at 8, and I, would, I wouldn't leave till 9. I loved it. I fell yeah. in love immediately. Okay. Just with the warehouse work. Yeah. It was like. The routine I, of it, yeah. the, the, the simplicity, but yeah. also the complexity. Yeah. I love that. When, so now that you're a number of months in, you said about four months in? Yeah. Then you made the transition? Yeah, so, so... tell me about that. So one of the most important aspects to an Amazon business is buying. Okay. So I didn't immediately become a partner in the company. That didn't come till about maybe three years later. Okay, so this um, is four months in, you started transition to the buying side. Of the yeah, spectrum. yeah. So I started buying, which is like a higher level task. It's okay. definitely, I think, the most important task in an Amazon business because okay. if you don't have good products, mm -hmm. nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how quickly you're processing it, mm -hmm. how quickly you're shipping it. They're not profitable. Okay. Um, so I started buying, and that really taught me a, a whole new side of the business, how to deal with vendor relationships, how to request discounts, how to grow our SKU count, all those things that are, like, for the next level. Okay. So you're constantly upgrading. I mean, that yeah. seems to be the theme in this this discussion yeah. is that you get to one sta stage, you're okay, but now it's ready for an upgrade. Yeah. Stage, okay, now ready for an upgrade. Yeah. So now you're upgrading to the buying side of the spectrum. Yeah. How, like, what did you learn most about yourself in that experience? Yeah. Um, the importance of relationships and okay. me getting out of my comfort zone. Okay. You know, because it's like... Me, I'm I'm an outgoing, personable guy. You are definitely 100. percent But there's a lot of times where I just kind of go inside, and mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to anybody. And like, but in the business, especially when you go to industry events, as mm -hmm. you know, you go to a lot as well. Yeah. Like that doesn't help you. Yeah. So like, just separating myself. Like, okay, this is the time I need to be that outgoing, personable guy. Right. And maybe tomorrow I can be to myself, but like today is the day I need to step it up. And really just go out there and start shaking people's hands and introducing myself. I'm curious because I've had discussions like this a lot with business owners. How did you learn that? Like, is that something that you feel was just innate, your ability to do that? Or did someone teach you that? Did you read it in a book? I, I, I think I get a lot of it from my mother. Okay. She taught me a lot. And my father as well. He's been in uh, a retail industry for years. So he always stressed the importance of relationships. And my mother's super outgoing and personable. So mm -hmm. I get a lot from my parents. So modeling their behavior. And yeah. But also a lot of it was learned through trial and error. Okay. Which I think is the best way. Yeah. Because when you make a mistake, both the chances of you making it again are slim to none. Yeah. Because you learn from it. Definitely. Okay. How, what was the transition like from buying to the next stage? Where, uh, so where did you go from there? I became a manager. Okay. Um, so I was managing a team of maybe 12 or 15 employees at the time. Okay. Um, you know, so the warehouse is definitely growing yeah. while, you're, while you're there. Yeah. By this time, we're now in probably our third warehouse, which is about 7,500 square feet. Wow. Okay. So the business is definitely going gangbusters. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, are you involved in a lot of the development of the 
processes and systems at this point, or is it still you just implementing the systems that are being shared with you? Yeah, so this is the year when I became a uh, manager. Is mm -hmm. the year we really started hammering down on our processes and systems. Okay. Originally, we didn't have many. Yeah. It was just like buy profitable products, mm -hmm. package them. You'd come into the warehouse. There'd be uh, a group of people over there. There's no organization. No organization. Mm -hmm. It was a side hustle that, yeah. that, that was doing. It a big side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. A um, 7,500 square foot side hustle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that uh, I, I, I see a lot of times that business owners go through that phase where they they grow but they, they grow almost in spite of themselves because yeah. they don't have any methodology by which they grow. So what was it that triggered you guys to say, hey, wait a minute, we need to we need to really systematize this? Yeah, so I would, I guess, mentor number four. I've never numbered my mentors like this. But <laughs> <laughs> it's but, the first uh, time for everything. <laughs> but I met this gentleman, uh, Ernie, who owns a huge wholesale company in New Jersey. Okay. And... Um, kind of put me under his wing and taught me a lot about the game. And he would bring me to his warehouse, which is like quarter million square feet. Oh my goodness. Um, and, and he would, t he taught me about like steps, mm -hmm. right. And how every additional step our employee takes, I lose money. Mm -hmm. And he taught me about having like the fastest selling products closest to the production stations. Wow. And he just taught, he ran the game for me yeah. and it opened up my mind and everything he taught me, we implemented in our warehouse. Uh, now it's all about strategy. Yes. Okay. And where we can shave, you know, because you can shave 10 steps a day, but you got 20 employees, 200 steps a day times, you know, yeah, 200 whatever work days in a year, it adds up. When you have steps, when the employees are taking steps, and you have multiple employees taking steps, <laughs> yeah. you get collision. Yeah. <laughs> and that uh, creates bottleneck. Mm -hmm. when, you look at, when you look at Ernie, now he's, he's sharing this wisdom with yeah. you. How did you meet Ernie? Like, like Craigslist. You, Craigslist. So you found him? Yeah, I, I yeah. was looking for a new supplier. Okay. And I, I originally met his sales rep, Eddie, who okay. still great friends with today. Okay. And Eddie said, hey, come to our showroom. We got, you know, you could check out our products. And I was like, this is great. Mm -hmm. So I went down there and I met Ernie that day. And then we started doing business with them. I feel like the best way to grow a relationship is spend money with the company you're trying yeah. to grow a relationship with. I get it. Definitely makes sense. The easiest way. When you look at, at that experience learning from Ernie, was that a similar experience than you had with your other mentors, or was it different? Like, what was like, what was that relationship like? It was it was very similar because with all my mentors and still the mentors I have today, um, we have one of the same mentors today. Is like, I put on blinders, mm -hmm. I don't pay attention to any of the distractions mm -hmm. and what they say I do right. because they are far more advanced than where I am. I think that's a huge, there's a lot of people, you, you get a mentor and then you see something on YouTube or, and you're like, oh, well, let me try this. Yeah. It's like, no, you, you paid this person for a reason. Exactly. Put the blinders on and do what they say. Do what they say. To yeah. Do. Okay. Implement. Yeah. When now, let's fast forward a, a, a little bit to the point in time when you're transitioning out of management and into part ownership. Yeah. How was that discussion like for you? Yeah. What was that? Yeah. Environment. So I always encourage everybody to, you want to have types of discussions, whether it's just a salary increase, you know, maybe a decrease in time with the salary the same, like whatever it is, mm -hmm. you need to schedule at minimum once a year mm -hmm. to discuss this with whoever you're working for. I, I right? So I, that. I, I had a conversation. I was like, listen, guys, I've been here for multiple years. I, I love the company. I'm working at this time, probably 70 hours a week. Yeah. You know, the chances of, I had some, some, the ball was in my court. You yeah, know? yeah. Because it's like the chances of them finding someone else who's going to dedicate themselves the way I have was, right. was very slim. Plus, I've known the guy and his, and his yeah. uncle for 18 years at that time. So, mm -hmm. um, the conversation was just had and they discussed it. And, and now, now you're an owner in the company. Yeah. I'm Edward Collins. This is Entrepreneur Unleashed. Eric Castellano. Great guest. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Phenomenal. Phenomenal.